All right. Well, good evening and welcome to 7 p.m. on Sunday at Dragon <laughs> Con. Uh, my name is Ron Daniels. This is Automated Speed Enforcement in Georgia. Uh, I'm going to introduce our two panelists. I'm the moderator tonight, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm an attorney down in middle Georgia. I do a very general practice, and some of that involves uh, doing some niche constitutional law stuff. Uh, I've at various points in my career done uh, a fair amount of criminal uh, defense work. I also do some local government representation. Uh, and then I'm going to turn it over to Jose down here to introduce himself. Hi, everybody. My name is Jose. I am uh, in the activism team at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is the longest running digital rights public interest law firm in the country. Um, we deal with all kinds of digital issues, um, and I am uh, I kind of focus in on law enforcement, surveillance, and tech regarding the carceral system, the border, and uh, workplaces as well, some kinds of what we call bossware and workplace surveillance and tech. Um, I also uh, work with a network of groups across the country, local groups, and uh, called the Electronic Frontier Alliance, of which EF Georgia is a member, and we are always welcoming new members. Uh, we just look for groups that are local, um, you know, kind of public interest oriented and have public events for their community members who want to affiliate uh, and kind of engage in the skill share um, with uh, the other members of the network. So that's that's a little bit about myself. Uh, good evening. My name is Corey Rosenberger. I'm an assistant district attorney in the Conasauga Judicial Circuit. That is Whitfield and Murray County uh, here in Georgia. Um, I've been practicing law for about 10 years. I started my career as a public defender doing criminal defense for indigent um, people charged with crimes. Um, I did that for about four years between before I actually swapped sides and started prosecuting. Um, and that's what I'm currently doing. And um, so I've, I've spent more or less a decade um, exclusively practicing criminal law. And before we get to the substance of everything, I'm going to tell you one thing real quick. Um, you have a Dragon Con app on your phone. Uh, go in there, rate this panel five stars. You can do it while the panel is going on because I can assure you this is going to be a five star panel. <laughs> uh, you can do it at the end if you want to. Um, the other thing is there's two lawyers up here. You're not our clients. We're not giving you legal advice. We're giving you general information about the law. If you want to hire a lawyer, you could theoretically hire one of the lawyers on the stage, but the other one <laughs> can't take private clients. So in other words, I'm not your lawyer. He's not your lawyer. Okay. Can't rely on what we tell you. Uh, it's just information. Uh, with that said, Jose, do you want to give us the 40,000 foot view of what we're talking about? Sure. So um, in 2017, uh, the, a bill was passed in the state of Georgia that said that um, private entities can engage in uh, speed light, uh, speeding enforcement around school uh, zones. I think that's the, the first part of what we're going to talk about today. Um, and it was implemented in 2018 and across the state a series of municipalities uh, contracted mostly with, from what I know, uh, Blue Line Solutions and Red Speed are the two main contractors. Blue Line is a Tennessee-based uh, contractor um, and uh, basically set these up, uh, set little cameras up around school districts. Um, in the first place, the companies uh, did, a, did the studies to say where they were needed. So we have to go a little bit on faith that they were telling the truth. Um, they added these cameras in and uh, then created a system where if you're driving during the school day or in some circumstances, if there's a construction, a road construction, um, you know, and there's a augmented speed limit because of that, um, you are going to then, you know, you'll, you'll see a sign in theory that says that there are speed cameras, that this is a school district. And between these hours, this is the this is the speed limit. Uh, you will then receive the ticket in the mail. The ticket in the mail uh, uh, across the country and across Georgia tends to be between $75 and $150, um, depending on the company, depending on the jurisdiction. Uh, in the case of Blue Line Solutions, you won't know that it was Blue Line Solutions that sent you this. You will get it signed by law enforcement. Um, in the case of Red Speed, um, I think that's ba basically the same. And there is a fairly unclear, for a lot of people, appeals process. Uh, so it, then you are paying the money. You either pay the money um, straight up to uh, one of these companies. You're not being told that it's going to the company. And then they will then send money back to the jurisdictions that they have uh, signed the MOU with. Um, which is usually the, the the city itself and or the law enforcement agency. 
um, in the, the state of Georgia, that also includes the school district. In most cases, the school district does not get a cut, but in some cases, they have been smart enough to, to make sure that they got a small cut. But the school district cuts, as far as I know, are usually around 5%. I mean, they're very, very low. The city's um, uh, the city cut is somewhere around 65%. Sometimes it's as low as 50, though. Um, and again, you know, you as the as the, uh, the the driver, or at least the the person who owns the car, because whoever is the owner of the car and the car is registered in is the one getting that ticket. Uh, uh, has to has to um, do it within a certain number of days, or they can uh, contact the the um, uh, the uh, Georgia state government and put a lien on your vehicle. If you are getting your car financed, um, then you are potentially subject to repossession if you do not get it in uh, in a timely manner. And then there's a huge question about the courts and like kind of how much the courts are able to actually handle the load. Um, and uh, how much the, uh, in many of the jurisdictions that I've seen, um, the traffic court specifically for these types of um, private, uh, privately uh, sent out tickets, speeding tickets, is twice a month. So you have a fairly small window for being able to, uh, to appeal this. Um, and uh, in many cases, the, in most cases, the courts, uh, although you may tell me otherwise, um, that there are generally backlogs. Uh, and uh, uh, there, our courts are very backlogged. <laughs> and then there is, you know, so, so there's a wider variety of questions, and I, I don't want to go all into all of them, but I think that's the kind of like the general uh, basis for it. Corey, please fill in any details. Well, and touching on that, Corey, do you want to just sort of draw the distinction between something like the, the speed enforcement, which is a civil penalty compared to if I got pulled over for going 80 by an officer. Yeah. So um, the difference there uh, is um, that in, especially in Georgia, you are entitled to a jury trial for any criminal offense from speeding to murder. If you say you want a jury trial, you get a jury trial. Um, you do not have the same right as my understanding for the civil penalties. Um, I, again, I, I practice exclusively criminal law, so I, I can talk about the evidence code and that kind of thing. But as far as the right someone has when they get one of these tickets in the mail, um, I'm, I'm a little more ignorant on that. Um, but uh, also, um, I would imagine that, you know, the points, getting points on your license, um, getting your license suspended, all of those would have to come from a criminal trial as opposed to a civil trial. And and I'll say this to our audience, this is a very open forum. Ask questions at any time. I, I've got some pre-selected for everybody to talk about, but if at any point in time you want to come down, just come to the green microphone in the middle of the room. You have to ask your question microphone so it picks up on the recorder. Otherwise, I'll embarrass you and say your question again on the microphone for the recording. Uh, but feel free to come down anytime. Um, can you all discuss perhaps the sort of the interplay on, because it is a civil penalty, it's civil in nature, confrontation clause issue. I mean, that's the big thing. You, know, you don't have an officer there saying, hey, I saw this person going that fast. How, how do you prove a case like that? So um, the confrontation clause is part of the U.S. Constitution. You have a right to confront your accusers. Um, and what that means in criminal law is that you have a right to uh, cross-examine every, every witness that it takes to prosecute your case. Um, and obviously, there, it's kind of questionable. Um, if it, who, it, who would that be when there is a camera that is taking pictures of you? Um, I've kind of looked at it a little bit, um, and if I, if I were to prosecute one of these things, um, I would have to call, you know, the the person that owns the the camera, the camera company, or someone from the business who says, yes, this is working properly. I have access to this footage or this these photos, and nobody else does. This is a true and accurate depiction of this license plate and you know speed that this car was going um, as it was traveling. The, the companies don't also, from what I understand, the companies don't come into the traffic courts. Mm -hmm. And so you're not confronting them. And because it's a private company and a privately owned camera that is monitoring, you know, and I want to, I will get into the data and we'll talk about data questions in a bit. But like, 
you also are not just going to get, you know, through a public records request or otherwise, the information that they have on you, your video or picture. And, and uh, Red Speed says, of course, that they make sure that, you know, the, the people get the ticket, get a, access to, to some of the video. Um, but in, in the end of the day, you actually have to, uh, to, to get a lawyer and to subpoena the company in order to get its records on you, in order to get that data in a way that you wouldn't if it was if it was a, a sheriff's office, the usual law enforcement agencies that that um, do these tickets. Got a question? I have two questions. Sure. First question, what about if you get a speed ticket outside of the hours, do you have to pay for the ticket? <laughs> and the second question is, what about if I'm driving your car, I'm speeding, got my picture, the ticket goes to you, are you required to pay even though you was not? Because if an officer stopped you, they ask for my dri my driver license, but right. it go to you. And you do you have a right to refuse it since you wasn't at the driver? So, and what will happen if you do refuse it? So that's one of the big problems. Great question. With the civil versus criminal. Um, in a civil case, the burden is more put. So in, in a, I'll start with a criminal. I know more about that. Um, in a criminal case, the burden is always on the state, um, me, um, or my employer. Um, and you know i have to you know prosecute the case i have to file a case i have to prove that you know the person that is in trouble is the person that is um was driving that vehicle a lot of that burden seems to shift um when it goes to civil uh to you know oh i have to you know you the the individual has to do a lot more affirmative things in order to defend themselves than the safeguards that criminal court um, has set up. Uh, so uh, I, I think those are those are uh, really important questions. Um, so part of it is when it comes to the the, the question of um, the hours, right? Uh, the uh, there are actually a series of class action lawsuits. You might you know y'all might know some of these and want to want to detail them better than I can. Um, but there's a series of class action lawsuits in the state of Georgia and in other, other, mostly in uh, the ones that I've seen have been in Ohio and a few other places where the uh, either there was uh, a change because of the time of year or because uh, of these were these were actually for construction sites that uh, and and you know road uh, renovation that was then ended and uh in other cases they were simply increasing the number of hours that the tickets uh that the cameras were looking for um the school zone speed uh instead of the norm the rest of the, the the time speed so there are thousands and thousands of these tickets going out every month per municipality it has vastly increased the number of tickets that are being um submitted to people to members of the public and tons of those people then have evidence that of course yeah they were actually driving outside of um the time uh that there is a school time uh a school speed limit and so far uh these people have you know if a class action lawsuit is taken um and it's only it's very narrowly defined on that question these people uh have gotten some money back and uh their their you know their tickets were uh uh the tickets were dropped but a, this doesn't have an effect on if it did have an effect on their license. This doesn't necessarily help if this had an effect on their car registration. Um, and B, you know, maybe you should not be selling a, a, a product to a local municipality that's supposed to do reduce, um, you know, speeding in your area if it's not ready yet, right? If you if you're a not able to have the human intelligence to make sure that you're always changing the times at the exact correct time when the speed limit changes and b if you don't have anybody going in and actually checking for errors right so you know if the company's not auditing itself and these are private and so there's no you know public oversight of them in terms of like a technical audit then that's a real problem i think the other thing in terms of the uh the the uh ticket going to the person who the car is registered in rather than potentially the driver is a, it's a very salient point. So, you know, they they can't automatically take your license um, for these, but it does go to a traffic court. And at some point down the line, I would imagine that might become an issue. But first, it starts with an, a, a check on your registration and uh, it can potentially uh, put a lien on your vehicle, as I said. 
the other thing is that they're very they they claim that they are not collecting for example pictures of the driver they are only picking up you know much less than what we would get from like a flock uh, automated license plate reader they claim you know there is a video uh which in which they get stills they have uh lasers that you know in one case tries to sense one car uh in another ca case uh in red speed's case they you know have lasers that track several cars at the same time and uh in those in that case they're only getting allegedly the speed the license plate the location time um and they claim they're not getting the make of the vehicle or you know how the vehicle is uh how the vehicle uh the state that it's in which a flock alpr would catch so um you know it leads a lot of big questions and then obviously it leads you know uh, uh, the first big question how do people who are not the driver in such a situation to appeal these types of things which maybe i can let the prosecutor talk more about well, and I'll add a little bit to that because I actually have a little bit of experience uh, getting a ticket. Um, <laughs> not not one of the schools on tickets. It, it works a lot functionally the same way as like toll by plate. It's going to go by the car, by the driver. That person's going to get the fine. They're going to get the letter. The burden is on them to right. then refute it. And it says the procedure for doing it. And it's about as clear as mud. Okay. I mean, and whether that's by design, whether that's just because it's convoluted, I'll leave that you to figure out. But it's all on the person then to say, and, and, you know, again, it's a salient point, but, you know, do you know who was borrowing your car on the 3rd of June between the hours 8.50 and, and 9.15? And if you don't, um, then, you know, too bad for you. Right. And if you get this bill two months later, um and you're good about checking your mail and you move quickly you might can do something to refute it but uh if you're like some people on this panel and get a told by plate <laughs> from florida and you have a bad tendency because all your bills come electronically to not check your mail you might get some penalties and lose your appeal rights so next question i i have a twofold question um the first is if this is a private company are they still subject to all the records and information yeah. being available via FOIA? And my second question is, this smacks to me very much of the police getting military equipment and private SCI prisons and a privatization that is kind of run amok. And who owns these companies? Because I get a feeling that it's a certain party that's involved with funding this so thank you so uh i, I think you I, I think everybody in everybody in the audience saw all three of us shake our heads no um that all of the safe uh, safeguards that are put into place to protect people from the government um you know foia acts any any sort of transparency laws do not apply to these companies but subpoenas do you you um you can submit an open records request for example and a lot of um a lot of uh you know local tv stations and radio stations and newspapers have for the mou with the city um for for other city documents or other city agreements with the companies that includes you know essentially the locations of the cameras when they were installed um you know and the like but you would have to subpoena the uh the companies like a private individual like they were a private individual or a private company in order to get those kinds of records and that is a i think a huge issue that is one of the big issues because there's a whole lot of other questions in play which is how how long is the data collected for how much of the you know how much data are they actually collecting what are they doing with the data because data is big business as well and then i think on the other question that you talked about um the privatization of policing and the privatization of of law enforcement um activity you know this is ticket by commission right like this is each uh each ticket these companies are raking in a lot of money and this is millions of dollars every few months per municipality every place that i've that i've seen every place that i've seen open records requests um or the company releasing information voluntarily to reporters uh the amount of money is very large so and like i said they're taking more than a third of a cut just a little bit more than a third of a cut on average so they have every reason to be uh, sending out as many as possible to get as much money back as possible because it's like it's like if you uh, have a late fee on your 
you know, or you, 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 have a, you have a late fee on your subscription service or something to that effect, you know, they don't have any reason to tell you that because then they're, you're paying them more money, right? So they have all the reason in the world to, to rake in a little extra profit off of people if, they, if you do refuse. And if you uh, appeal, there are charges, there are extra charges. So they have found ways to, to add little fines and fees that are, again, to a private company, not to your municipality, not to your school district necessarily, um, based on them trying to send it out to as many thousands of people and as, as many thousands of cars as possible on a monthly basis. And the numbers, again, are very high in terms of how many people are being ticketed on a, on a monthly basis or an annual basis per municipality, um, regardless of if it's six cameras or 30. And two things before we move on to our next question, but uh, other sources of places you can direct an open record request in Georgia. For you to have one of these cameras, the Georgia Department of Transportation has to say, yes, there is a need for one here. You have to complete an application. There are certain permits that you have to have. You have to have certain studies about calibration, things like that on the camera, but you also have to show, and according to the statute, you have to show there's, and make the GDOT believe and determine there is a need for it. And all of that is open record material, things you can get. The other thing, too, is, look, I don't think anybody up here, and I'm, I hate to speak for people, but we can all generally agree that driving too fast in a school zone is is bad. It's not something, you know, we all probably have less of a problem getting a ticket from an officer if we're going 80 in a school zone than we do from a camera. That, right. you know, the money is going to the local community. It's, you know, you have a person there. So it you're hitting the nail on the head. The large part of the problem is we're talking about some company somewhere and we don't know who they are uh it's not john smith the officer we know that's parked there and you know um, and they have so, a financial incentive yeah. i mean they have a direct financial incentive yeah uh, but but they are subject to subpoenas they really don't like it but both companies claim to be privately owned um not run by venture capitalists or private equity firms but you know, yeah, <laughs> you always have to do your investigations for sure. Next question. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I was, yeah. uh, really, I have like two statements. One, private private industry should not be anywhere near fines. That's always bad. Agreed. But two, kind of one of the problems with the getting the ticket by mail. I don't remember what I was doing that day. I may have not been speeding and it's really hard in a video to do calculations and say this was X distance, especially you know, it's 50 miles away from home to, to fight it. Yeah. But the two questions I had was uh, with class action lawsuits, y'all mentioned that. And I think a lot of people in the crowd may not know this. I know I don't. Are you, if you decide not to go with the class action, whether you are informed or not, are you locked out of suing still for problems? No, but it's such a small amount of money per ticket yeah. that, like, what lawyer is going to take a $150? Yeah. Well, ticket. you know, a pro se litigant, you know, there's always that. But two, um, you can you can you can represent yourself in the appeal court, mm -hmm. but in terms of if you want to try to go after the company, I don't know a lawyer that would take a hundred fifty dollar ticket question. And that comes to more towards my other question is: is let's say you know it's eighty bucks for it. We'll just say it's eighty bucks for it. A lot of people. It's at least a day out to fight the ticket, right, right. if not more. And I don't think a lot of people can afford that kind of time. Even at that, I mean, like, what are your vacation days worth? Even if you're not losing money off of it. Right. And I'm wondering if the, my question is, is if there's ways you can recoup after it's found that you prove, you prove that they were in the wrong to recoup money back from that for those kind of losses. I have not heard of anybody recouping those losses outside of a class action lawsuit. Um, and, you know, and I would I would say without straying too far from the the uh, main topic, I think that law enforcement uh, uh, as a revenue stream, whether it's public or private, is an issue as well. And this is this is how fines and fees often are structured. This is how bail and, and probation pr processes are often structured to get small amounts of money from very poor people often, from working class people who can't afford to challenge that again and again and again. Um, and, you know, and then it just kind of eats up at, at your, uh, your pocketbook if you're not well paid like a public interest activist or these, uh, these lawyers. Well, you know, it's, it's a war of attrition. Right. What it is. It's right. The, you know, 
at the end of the day, who's going to win um, the little dink and dunk game in a war of attrition? You, you know, an average person or even above average person or a million dollar company. I'll tell you which one spends a lot more money on lawyers and is used to those kind of fights. Um, and has in, in, you know, already has counsel, in-house counsel, so they're not paying extra. But that, I think that's absolutely, you know, there's one reason the fines are not seven, eight hundred dollars is when you do that calculus in your head that you just did standing up here uh, and you realize that I can pay 80 bucks or I can miss a half day of work, uh, potentially pay a lawyer uh, and still potentially come out, you know, in the, you know, in the losing column, uh, they they kind of expect that reaction out right. of you, that it's easier to go. Oh, shucks. I'll just have to, to pay more attention. If you do want to um, contest the ticket, of course, you should do it as soon as possible because then you will, otherwise, you will have fees and fines that start to mount up. But like I said, in many jurisdictions, they tack on extra fees for appealing, which is um, not how our legal system is supposed to work. Next question. You got two questions? No, just one. Oh, darn it. <laughs> we were on a roll with two questions. Um, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> so um, speaking of $700, $800 tickets, there's a, um, there's a railroad crossing in my hometown where um, folks have been getting stopped. I mean, folks have been getting pulled over for illegal stopping on the, on the tracks or, or within 25 feet being too close to the tracks. Um, and the, up until recently, the, the police were using the dash cam to, to ticket folks for it. You know, it's marked on the ticket, the, the dash cam is footage if they've got it. Um, and uh, they put in a camera though, now up above like a 360 looks like a 360 type deal that catches the whole intersection and i'm just wondering is there really is there um what am i missing thinking that the cost the cost really isn't much different with um outsourcing it to a private company because even in the case of the police officer um with a dash cam uh, ca capturing it the real person there the officer i've still got to file a motion um a discovery request to get the prosecution to give me that dash cam footage before I show up to contest the ticket. And isn't that cost and that that time of making that motion for discovery to get the dash cam footage? What's the comparison between the cost of that and the cost of the subpoena to the private company? A lot, it, it's a lot cheaper just to demand discovery because I mean, in, in Georgia in particular, you're entitled to that, um, to subpoena a private company. Uh, in assuming it's an out of state company, because both of them are out of state for us, uh, you are automatically looking at having to get a process server in another state to serve subpoena because you can't send an out of state subpoena by certified mail uh, or regular mail. And so you're automatically saying they are 50 to 100 bucks to serve the subpoena. You'll have to get the subpoena. There'll be a fee for a subpoena. You'll have to pay mileage uh, and a per diem for them to come. So you are automatically spending two, 300 bucks just to issue a subpoena, um, okay. versus, you know, you know, a discovery demand in Georgia can be a, simple as a, a letter saying, I demand reciprocal discovery in this case. Uh, and they got to turn it over to you. If they got it and they don't turn it over to you, um, there's some bad things that can happen to them. Um, spoliation of evidence, Brady exclusion, things like that. So, and, uh, and, and my second question then is, um, is that yeah. is that a um is it a civil violation in that case the stopping or, or standing where um where uh like they've got the responsibility to turn the evidence over but um if i don't or if the person doesn't request it then um they you lose by default because it's a civil violation they don't have to put on the they don't have to produce it because the burden's on you since it's a civil case to prove that you're innocent I think that as far as the railroad, like blocking a railroad crossing, I would I would say that that's probably a criminal traffic offense, um, which would give you all of the protections under the law that you know our founding fathers intended, um, the right to remain silent and still proceed, discovery as he said, and that kind of thing. Um, but I, I don't believe you can correct me if I'm wrong. I I don't I've never heard of civil a, a civil penalty for um blocking a railroad the the other thing i would say is that um this is profit making so so in a case like that that's probably an automated license plate reader from flock or vigilant solutions not 
a uh, not a speed you know camera from from one of these other companies. Um, but in both cases, data is a big part of their product, right? They are sharing that they're keeping that data privately. They're keeping it nationally privately, right? It goes to their, uh, in the case of Blue Line Solutions, it goes to their Tennessee offices. Um, and then they can also sell it to other law enforcement agencies all across the country, or they can, you know, have agreements to just share that kind of data with law enforcement agencies all across the country, including in a state, for example, where something that isn't criminalized in your state is criminalized in that state. And if they want to track you into that state when you drive into that state they may be paying attention to you and have that extra data on hand because they got it from vigilant or flock or whoever else so i would say data is a is big business Data is a big big part of this business obviously in the case of what we're talking about in terms of the the speed ticket um the, the speed cameras they're making money every single ticket that they issue so if that's seven thousand tickets in two months um if that's four million dollars in five months these are these are numbers that I've seen in specific Georgia municipalities. They're taking, like I said, about a third of that, and plus any more and kind of extra fines and fees that they're adding. So it's very profitable for these ones. But data is big business. So data at minimum is a big part of uh, how the other ones are making money off of it. Next question. Yes. Uh, my understanding, you said that it's a private company. Uh, is there a, and there's no oversight by the government that hires them? to ensure that they are ethical and they are not fraud because you could just pass on the street. You was there, but you didn't go 70 miles an hour. You, you went the speed limit or maybe two miles over the speed limit. And they said you went more than that. And if it's big business and every ticket you make money and you know that they, it's hard for people to defend themselves because the ticket is only a hundred bucks, uh, there is an incentive for fraud. Absolutely. And so uh, my question is, is the government that hires them ensuring that we are being protected? So when in, uh, for example, in Youngstown, Ohio, when there was, when they found that the cameras were increasing the amount of time that they were, um, checking people for, uh, for, uh, the school zone speed limit beyond the hours that they were supposed to like you know the city government was you know it's law enforcement officers are supposed to sign off on every single one of the tickets but there was no oversight obviously and there is no oversight unless you make sure that the city government in your community for example passes a community control over police surveillance um ordinance or some other kind of oversight there's there's definitely stuff on the on the front end that they are supposed to uh, they're supposed to release to the Department of Vehicles uh, of Motor Vehicles in in each state. But you know, yeah, they have they have a full incentive because of course they're going to take a loss when there's a class action that proves that there was you know something that could have been fraud, could have been an error. But you know, they're going to make a lot more money because most people aren't doing those class action lawsuits. Most municipalities aren't seeing that kind of pushback. And most people don't really, you know, you're not really thinking in terms of how do we, what is our way to push back on a, on a few hundred dollars that you've had to pay for a ticket? Well, and, and, and directly to that, GDOT does have some oversight over these. They, they require them to keep the calibration records. They have to be produced to GDOT upon request. They have to keep three years worth of calibration records, not just, you know, last months. Uh, they are required to maintain the, the actual equipment and those things and to meet all the standards GDOT promulgates for them. And they assign them, based on districts, certain engineers within Georgia Department of Transportation who are over that particular you know, region that they have to report to and keep up with. So th there is some level of state government oversight, um, but it's not really down to the brass tacks of how many people are getting fines and things like that. It's, it's more about how it's impacting the roadway. And the county governments and the, you know, and the law enforcement agencies that are contracting with them, there's, there is no oversight there. Can I just quick follow up? I mean, if, if uh, it's one thing to, to, to send reports to people and another thing for the report to be genuine. Right. Uh, and I, I know that that, that happens. Mm -hmm. And so if, 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 if no one's checking the reports and verifying that they are accurate, then you're just getting false data 
and you believe you're getting good data and no one's checking it. Uh, that's how frauds happen. And so far, there, the, I, there has been no criminal liability for the companies for errors or fraud, whatever it might be. And I think that there's also, we should expect the, that our local governments, if they're going to make these agreements, if they're going to make these contracts, would have some oversight, would pay attention, especially if it's their law enforcement officers that are supposed to sign each check or sign each, um, each uh, ticket. Uh, ticket. Next question. Um, I have two. So I think the first one is, you touched on it a little bit, but I was wondering if you go into a little more depth about ownership and who the images and photos and all the data, whatnot, who does that belong to? It's so my first one. And then my second one is, is there any federal regulations or is it just at the state level right now? Uh, the private companies own the data um, that they are collecting. Including um, the images? Including the images, which allegedly, according, according to them, does not include an image of the driver. Um, but yes, the, the private companies do, which means that they don't have to keep it in Georgia. They, can, they, they actually explicitly say that, they, that in Blue Line Solutions case, the data is all going through Tennessee which creates a security issue, potentially, right? And it also creates an issue of, well, what are they gonna do with the rest of the data? Now they're, now it's proprietary, they get to own it. It's not something that's just in the public domain. Of course, they're gonna send it back to, you know, once they've signed off on it, they're gonna send some of that data back to the municipality because an officer has to sign it. But, uh, but yeah, like I said, it's big business. They get to collect that data and that is their da data, they own it. Unless, unless of course, legislation is passed that says that there is a data erasure policy, for example. You could have a data erasure policy in New Hampshire. Um, they have one of, of a few minutes. Uh, so you could have data erasure policies that are extremely strong that say that anything, for example, any vehicle that was not caught speeding has to be erased immediately. And then obviously, if you've got a vehicle sped, that data is kept long enough to you know, go through the process. But all the other vehicles are currently being, you know, that data can be collected on and kept, regardless of the fact that these people aren't even going to be accused by uh, Blue Line or, or Red Speed of speeding. Thank you. And I think, and my second question again was, is there any federal regulation or is all of this happening at the state level right now? Uh, as far as I'm not aware of anything I, that, yeah. the federal, right. neither am I. No, it's a, it's a patchwork for the states and municipalities. Next question. You so, got two? Uh, I, no, I have one. I have a shorter one now because I, I was going to ask a question and I'm going to follow up here. But you second. had two. So. No, just one. Okay. But I do have <laughs> Three uh, count. I do have two tickets that I've, well, <laughs> one I've received. Don't admit that you've received it. You uh, received was, it. Uh, the year, years ago. One that I don't know if I'm going to receive. <laughs> and, and it goes back to the question of why people have an issue with automated ticketing right? is it does not take context into account, right? Uh, you get pulled over for speeding you tell a cop, my wife's pregnant, they're going to say go, right? Um, and so in one of my cases, um, I got, it was only six bucks or 10 bucks for the toll road on 85, just north of um, right by Spaghetti Junction, right outside the perimeter. Um, my daughter said I wasn't in the toll lane. I never drive over there. Um, you know, but there's an accident. If I have to, I go around. And if you look at the image, there's no other cars at three o'clock on a Friday, an image other than my wife's car. You can see the background a little bit. I'm like, there was an accident there. Right. And she went around, but it's kind of hard to prove that the second case, which was just a couple of weeks ago, um, school zone. And, uh, I drove through, came up the other side, driving the speed limit. In my rear view mirror, I saw the school zone lights were on. I turned around. I'm like, I don't see them on the other side. So I then recorded the entry through the school zone. It was during the marked time, but there were no lights on. Uh, so I already contacted my police department that day saying, this is what's going on. Your lights were, indi were not indicating it was a school zone. So I thought it was a different time because you weren't on. Um, and so my question really was going to be about data retention. Um, about data retention, do most contracts not have that? Or are they saying, you know, keep it for a year, even on the ones where they did commit the infraction, 
but after a year, delete it, or are they keeping it indefinitely? Uh, as far as I know, they're keeping it indefinitely. In some states, there are restrictions. Usually, it's a state-by-state -state basis. It's less common in municipally, uh, municipality one of three months, six months, two years. Um, the companies tend to claim, at least the companies in the, the automated license plate reader uh, world, tend to claim that 30 days would be a good practice, but they don't suggest that at the time of the MOU. They don't suggest that at the time of the contract. They kind of say that in the press. Um, and then when they're actually discussing with the MOU, with the <laughs> municipality or with the homeowners association or whomever else, they're happy to keep the, the data as long as possible. And I'll, some of that is indefinite. Some of the, the restrictions are several years, as I said. And like I said, you know, that then allows for investigations around a whole lot of other things other than what the cameras were originally supposed to be there for. I don't now I'm not I'm not a fan of any of this. I think that there is uh, possibly a way to do it that is slightly better. But one of the claims that the companies make then is that there is less racial disparity and that's a pretty important one because there are many different parts of the of the country where you know if you're speeding your your skin color is going to have a big impact on if you're stopped and then it might also have an impact on the outcome of the interaction with the law enforcement officer and so the the uh the companies you know their their claim and one of their pitches is that we are reducing that kind of interaction both to protect law enforcement officers blue line solutions name is is based on uh the issue of, of officers you know losing their lives um in the in the in you know the the in their duty so you know like that's the claim is that it both protects drivers and it protects uh officers from potentially dangerous interactions based around something that that could just be a ticket that's sent but the, the tech isn't there the oversight isn't there i would say and then this this question of data being collected and then packaged as a product because now they can they they keep it in a cloud they can um trade it with other companies and there are other companies there whose whose whole kind of mo is to say we have as much data information that we've collected from cell phone companies from app companies any other kind of location services companies as well as automated license plate reader companies and uh red speed and blue line solutions so we know where people across this country are at all times this is useful data for either public agencies or for private entities. Some of that data, they're, I think they're holding on to to figure out what the products are, but in most cases, they know what the product is. It is a product and we are the product rather than you know, clearly deleting it as soon as the, the, the data is no longer useful for them for the specific purposes of enforcement of speed laws. Next question. Uh, yeah, sorry, I didn't get here at the beginning of the panel. Though I've been to other panels by this group at this convention, and you did just answer some of what I was going to ask about um, racial disparities. But another question that came to mind, and again, sorry if this is, apologize, this has already been discussed, but are there differences between like license plate readers that like are like block that you just see it that are blending in with like street lights, and then others that like are on top of the police cars? And I just wonder, like, can they be set to alert? Like, we're only going to alert if this person has a warrant for a felony or we're, we're going to alert to all warrants even if it's for failing to appear in court for a traffic citation. Like, can it be set to only alert for certain? Because I, I, the city I live in, Roswell, Georgia, they make almost all their police reports publicly available for free. So, like, a lot of the narratives it'll, in the officer's narratives, it'll say, I was alerted via my um, license plate reader that this, that the driver in front of me had an active warrant for failing to appear in court. Like, could they be set to only alert for people wanted for serious felonies? Uh, th that's mostly a hot list question, I think, um, to, to a certain degree. So it's totally different, again, from the speeding, from the school uh, uh, zone speeding question, because those companies very much claim that they don't take hot lists. This isn't about that kind of enforcement, and they don't collect other information beyond license plate and the speed and, and the like. Um, but ALPRs, uh, the automated license plate readers from Vigilant Solutions, from Flock, Fusis, um, other companies like that, they collect a, a massive amount more data. They say that they collect images of the driver, they collect the make and model of the vehicle, they, they pitch that this is the kinds of stuff, the level of blight, they could pick up a bumper sticker. If, so, you know, if they want to hot list the politics of a certain bumper sticker, they could do so. And then what they do in part is that they get these hot lists from law enforcement agencies. Some of these are national law enforcement agencies or, or from 
databases that are national through the fusion center, uh, the, the local fusion center. Um, and some of them are from uh, the local law enforcement agencies, of course, potentially stolen vehicles or vehicles where there have been issues in the past. And then some of them are also from car rental agencies. Car rental agencies send hot lists that are quite long. They don't take cars off the, the hot list. Um, and so these are all kinds of reasons that a, that a vehicle might get flagged by um, ALPRs in particular. Uh, and then, um, and then you know, yeah, they, they send the information on to law enforcement. They also keep the, the data in-house. So now a private company has that data on anybody who's, uh, who gets tracked by an ALPR. That includes where you were, when you were, uh, you know, all sorts of information about your vehicle. Then there's another ALPR somewhere else. And so now they can say how fast you got to the other, uh, the other ALPR and they can track you around your community. Um, and that, you know, like I said, that goes to local law enforcement, state law enforcement, federal law enforcement, in many cases, in most cases, through the fusion centers and uh, to a private entity. And then, you know, it goes to, it could go to law enforcement in another state. You may have, you may be in Georgia, you may have a Georgia license plate, uh, but, you know, I mean, Flock doesn't really care. You may drive into California or Alabama or Tennessee um, or anywhere else in the country. And this, if Flock is the contractor, they've got that data in both places and they will also pr package that as a product. But confirming that law enforcement agencies can filter what to alert. Yeah, yeah, they can. Um, I mean, just like you can filter a search. I mean, that's right. And and some and some law some law enforcement agencies ostensibly try to limit it because some things, for example, are criminalized in one jurisdiction but not another, and so they don't want to have a hot list that includes uh, you know people in one area. So, for example, take reproductive rights. You can have uh, a a law enforcement agency that wants to hot list people that they think are pregnant, that they think there's the possibility of engaging in something that has been criminalized in their area around, you know, abortion or whatever. Um, there may be another community that uh, specifically doesn't track that, that, you know, uh, even in a state maybe that where that has been criminalized, there may be a city, a municipality that makes a contract with the ALPR company that states we specifically do not want to track that. We want to track homicide. Or we want to track, you know, these, you know, car theft, trafficking of, you know, human trafficking, um, and these kinds of crimes. But generally, they do collect a lot more than they say, and it tends to not just be, you know, human trafficking and uh, and homicide and, and car theft. Next question. I have one question and one statement. Is that good? That counts for two. <laughs> <laughs> roll, roll. roll. I like it. Okay. Uh, question: Is it a good thing to have a dash cam in your car just in case you get into one of these situations with the camera? I, I'm going to say no, <laughs> and that might be a surprise to everybody. But my theory is: Is this what happens when something bad happens that you captured? Is on is the discoverable? Camera? Yes. Yeah. I, but, I think I think there's a little bit of you know. Surveillance is when we're getting watched from the top. Surveillance is when we watch back, right? So I think that there, I think that there can be situations where it can be helpful if yeah. you are very, very good about a making sure that you're, uh, you're, you know, not recording onto a cloud, you're not recording onto the internet, you're not recording onto a, a device that could be hacked, because then you're just leaving yourself up to hackers and scammers, um, and that you're engaging in regular erasure, but you know, you also then get into a situation where if you don't erase info before, uh, you know, your city government, you know, demands it, it yeah. that now you've uh, now you've you, you know, have a bigger problem. <laughs> you have a bigger problem. So, yeah. um, statement uh, in, in my local area. I live here in Atlanta. And I noticed that the the um, warning light, yellow light that tells you the school zone is active this hours. That thing was not working for about half the school year. And I took it upon myself to go talk to the principal and say, hey, you know, you have this light down there and it's not working. What's going on? That's when somebody actually fixed it. Yeah. So my, my, my point then is if you have, if you're, if you're like me and you depend on that visual to tell you, oh, slow down, and you go through the camera, is that, can you then go back and say, hey, I did not get the warning from that? Or is that sign that says, you know, disregard the light or whatever 
that that light is supposed to be working for mm -hmm. for that ticket to be enforceable. That's one of the things they're they're supposed to keep doing. Now, how do you prove that it wasn't right. working? That's that's the problem. you have to get a dash cam. But that's <laughs> right, that's right, right, that's right. <laughs> but I think Corey wanted to offer something on that. So the the dash cam is is kind of an interesting point. Um, I've never on defense or prosecution. I've never had a client that says said I have a dash cam. Like, can I show you? Like, this is what happened. On the flip side, I've never had a police officer who said, you know, I observed that their vehicle had a dash cam that memorialized their own crime. Um, I, I wrote a search warrant for it or something like that. I do believe that it would take more than just the officer. The officer wouldn't be able to just take right. your um, your dash cam legally. Um, yeah, legally, uh, he would he would he would have to write a search warrant for it. I believe. Thank you. Next question. Okay, so I have just one question here. I know time is short, but just to piggyback on what this gentleman started and what he just mentioned and everything about, um, I guess, capturing things yourself. Theoretically, in an experiment, not an experiment, but let's say this speed light camera thing is in a neighborhood, right? And walking kids to school, you know, hey, I'm just going to walk them to school and you start noticing that things are not working right. And you have maybe two weeks worth of data, right? It's not working. Could that private company come after, say, me, because I've recorded this stuff, not on purpose, but yeah, your stuff's not working and you're still sending out tickets? I don't think that they could no. come after you, even if you did it intentionally. There, there, are, uh, there are definitely lawsuits that companies will do based on going after their software or trying to track uh, you know, how the data is being sent and, you know, finding security vi uh, vulnerabilities, that kind of thing it tends to be a lawsuit. And sometimes a lawsuit that Electronic Frontier Foundation will protect the little guy in. Okay. Um, but I, you know, I think on the outside, you are in a public space. It is a private, you know, camera, but it's also like, even if it was a public camera, it is outside. It is, you know, a, a, a public area. And I don't, I wouldn't see any you know, they people. would lose. I mean, yeah. this is America. You can sue anybody over anything if or, you really want to. Or you get scared and you'd lose just because you're scared. You, you, you may get kicked out of court, but you can file a lawsuit against anybody over anything. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, they, I don't think they could say anything about you surveilling them in open sure. public. You know, there's, there, okay. there's no way they could win that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Just only one. <laughs> Next question. Uh, hey, my question is... Uh, the placement of these cameras, like public property, roads, sideways, like who approves that? Is it county boards, local G -Dot. boards, GDOT? That's the like. So who makes the request? Did the police make the request? Along or? with school districts, right? There was there was an attempt in Georgia to um, to actually eliminate school districts, specifically on the on school speeding zones. Um, there was an attempt to eliminate the school districts from having to be a participant to it. And that was defeated. So school districts um, and whoever the, you know, usually it's with a municipality. Usually it's with the local mayor's office or the uh, the um, sheriff's sheriff's department or police department. Um, so they would also have to agree to it. But from what I've seen, the companies really do claim that the placement they actually dictate the placement usually because they're the ones who are doing the studies in the first place to prove that these are the areas where it's an issue. Um, and then, of course, they're also the ones who come back anecdotally and say, you know, we're not going to give you all of our data, but, you know, the, the, the problem is going down. In each case, they usually say that they're, they're, uh, they are the solution and the problem is going down. So a, a bit of it is on faith from, um, from them unless the municipality or GDAC gets, uh, gets into the act of um, either auditing their studies or doing its own studies exactly, and, and then making the decision on placement based on um, public, uh, public funded studies. So if GDOT's the one approving the placement, is there a mechanism for the public to object to that placement like you would at a local board hearing type of scenario? So that you've got to get through the local board before GDOT can do the termination of need and finally sign off on it and say, hey, okay. So okay, so the, there the, is the point, a yeah, the point where you get not necessarily is is yeah. when the local agency, the county government, municipal government is considering entering into MOU. Uh, that's the point in time where you can speak up and get something in there. If, if the if your municipality has a structure for that, in some cases. You know, municipalities and law enforcement agencies can actually sign off on it without they, you know, this is not buying a, a, a product. This is not 
um, managing a product, right? The private company still so owns the camera. Subscribing to a service, right? Right. Yeah. The, the, the private company is the one who pays for just about everything in, in this particular case, in the school zone um, uh, uh, case, because they're reaping a profit off of every ticket, so they can easily afford to cover that. Um, so there is, you know, I think also the school district and the school board might be another option because, you know, school districts still in Georgia have to sign off on the school zone speed cameras. Okay. And then just the last thing I just wanted to comment was, I remember a couple of months ago, I saw an article in South Carolina where I guess they did some sort of audit and they found that hundreds of, I think they were flock cameras in this case, were being placed on public roadways and GDOT had never mm -hmm. permitted them. And I think in South Carolina, they actually forced them to shut down their service so they could audit the whole state because they found that cameras are being placed on sides of roadways and highways and stuff that were never approved and permitted. The the other side of that, unfortunately, is that um, a number of these companies, when the contract is cut or when they are told to not engage in the, the, the surveillance, that this is not something that the um, local or state uh, agencies um, want to participate in, they often leave them up. They don't actually clean up the devices um, very frequently. And, you know, and that means that we have to take it a little bit on uh, on faith that they are not collecting data still. All right, we're moving to lightning round. We got two minutes, so uh, fire. I was just gonna piggy up, piggy up, piggyback off his uh, question. If we do, if we as a person disapprove of the camera in the area or want them removed, what could we do? Write your county commissioners, city right. councilmen, School board members, everybody, and the that press. you can get an address for, and the press, and the press. Um, so I guess the premise behind these devices is that they would keep kids safer. Right. Um, is there any actual evidence that that's the case, or is this just an emotional appeal to get communities to buy into it? Uh, as far as I've seen, uh, all of the study that I've seen has come from the companies, but they do claim in every case that there is between 70 and 85 percent decrease in speeding in those areas. You know, and like if the tech worked and it was in the public hands and uh, it wasn't ticketing a million people and there was a clear appeals process and no extra fees and, you know, wasn't considered a revenue making um, uh, uh, endeavor instead of something that was purely about safety. I think that, you know, I think that there is a, a world in which we could think of this as something that could be functional for people in a, in a different way than it is today. but. We're taking it a lot based on what Blue Line Solutions is telling the municipalities and the state government, and we're taking it based on what Red Speed says. So, all right, got one last question, and we're going to have to answer it in thirty seconds or less. Okay, so let's say that I um, I subpoena the private company that's got the footage for some unspecified uh, traffic violation, and um, the state, uh, you know, just they don't drop the case, and so we go to trial over it, and. Um, and they put on the um, as an they put on as their witness an expert from the private company, and he's going to testify that he can't explain specifically how the technology, how he can verify that the technology um, caught the the violation. Uh, let's say it's a video footage, but they they can't show you the the time. All they've got is a a still image of it of it, and they say that that's the evidence that you were doing the violation. Um, is the expert's faith admissible? The expert said, I don't know that it, the technology worked, but I can tell you that I have faith that it did. Would that be? No, could I, could under, I under Georgia's evidentiary rules, that would not be admissible testimony. So that couldn't be the basis of it. Can, of, you know, anything. I, I, I'm curious about how they would, as a prosecutor, I'm curious how they would prove this at court. Um, if it, it, can you take one of these civil penalties to a, to a civil trial? Yeah. Okay. But it's a different type of trial. So, yeah. and we're out of time. I would remind everybody rate this uh, panel in your app. I think it was five star worthy, don't y'all? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, it, it, and I appreciate y'all giving us a round of applause, but you'll give a round of applause to our volunteers who run this track and put everything in. I didn't know we were going to.